2018 is the year that we are finally getting the long-in-development live-action Battle Angel Alita film from producer James Cameron, who originally intended to direct, and directed by Robert Rodriguez. This could, maybe, possibly, be the first major live-action adaptation in the U.S. of an anime or manga that could do well. To be clear, this is not the first live-action adaptation of anime that has come out of the West. These are not even remotely new. One of the earliest reviews on this channel is my review of the live-action version of The Giver. The early 90s gave us the inexplicably PG-13 live-action version of Fist of the North Star, which is a thing should, that should not have been. And the early 2000s gave this the better-than-it-had-any-right-being live-action Blood the Last Vampire, which nobody saw. And then there was the live-action version of Dragon Ball, which was an abomination in the eyes of God, and the live-action Ghost of the Shell, which, even if it didn't have the albatross of whitewashing around its neck, suffered from a plot that was solidly mediocre. I'd make a remark about how Western live-action anime films are in that dark place that comic books fit, films were in after Batman and Robin came out, but before X-Men and Spider-Man came out. But we haven't had our Superman yet. We're still in the realm of the made-for-TV Incredible Hulk films and the um, first Doctor Strange live-action film and the unreleased Fantastic Four movie. That's where we're at. We haven't even gotten Superman. We haven't even gotten our Tim Burton's Batman yet. Still, Battle Angel Alita has a solid director and an equally solid cast. But for anime films to succeed, we need more than just one-offs. And looking at what's happened in the past with live-action western and anime adaptations, it's clear there's a pattern here as to why these films failed. Either the writers or the studio didn't get the concept, or the concept was just over people's heads, which is something that's not too surprising considering both Blade Runner films have originally tanked while in theaters. Or... The producers picked a license based on its popularity, and not because they actually knew anything about it. So we get a film with characters named by Akira Toriyama, a man who never saw a pun he didn't like, played deadly serious. So if we're going to get good live-action western anime adaptations, plural, the first battle is picking the right property. And not necessarily picking the most popular property, the one that all the fans want to see done in live action on the big screen, or picking your favorite, as that would. Though having a passion for the franchise certainly helps. It's choosing your franchise based on the story and characters first, and what kind of budget you can afford, then worrying about whether or not it has any real name recognition. And to be clear, you're not necessarily going to get a high budget. Unless Battle Angel Alita blows up at the box office, they're going to get a moderate budget film. Alita has the budget that it does because James Cameron and Robert Rodriguez are attached to it. Cameron currently has a golden touch, with even films that are, in hindsight, fairly mediocre, like Avatar, still having done incredibly well at the box office, and Rodriguez has built a tremendous reputation of getting a lot out of a little. Any other director, unless they're a really big name, isn't going to command that budget, even if they have big stars attached to their movie. Also, a film is going to get any leverage, speaking of big stars, you need to have one attached to the film. Someone who is bankable, someone who the studios say, okay, we have this actor attached to this film, people will go see this, act this movie because this actor or pair of actors are in it. And from the sound of things, studios appear to have learned at least one of the right lessons from Ghost in the show and recognize that whitewashing is something to, avo to be avoided. Asian characters should be played by Asian actors, although race lifting, putting people of color into the film where people of color were not before, is okay. And with that big, long prologue out of the way, here are my five anime properties that I think can work, should work, and will work in live action from a Western studio. Well, at least, can work and should work. The will is a all depend on the execution. As with all the previous similar lists I've done, these are in no particular order. Honorable mention, Cowboy Bebop. I'm making this an honorable mention because while this is the obvious pick, it's also been picked. The 
Cowboy Bebop series has been licensed and optioned for a live-action film or series of films and has been in development yell hell for freaking years. You could make this film with the budget of a season of The Expanse or less. And part of the thing for, with Spike and Jet and Faye and Ed is that they're pretty much from anywhere. At most, Faye is probably from Southeast Asia due to the background and the tape she sends to herself, so that needs to be kept under consideration for the casting. But other than that, like, Keanu Reeves was attached to play Spike in the previous, previously planned version of the film, which has now been scuttled, and Keanu has basically come out and said, yeah, I was attached to this, I would have liked to play it, but like, that's not a thing anymore. So, but still, Hollywood knows this can work, it's just a matter of getting the project off the ground. If the Battle Angel Alita movie does well, maybe this will get jump-started, and we'll get a good release. A good director, and all that other stuff. But, in the meantime, this will sit in the honorable mention category, where it's clear Hollywood knows this will work, or knows it should work, they just haven't gotten around to trying yet. Number five, Black Lagoon. R-rated action films are starting to get back in vogue, and as far as the premise goes, Black Lagoon lends itself well to an R-rated action film. Corporate schmuck Rokuro, or Rock, which will end up being called for the rest of the film and any subsequent sequels, much as he does in the show, gets caught in the middle of blackmail between his company's dirty deeds and Russian gangsters who are blackmailing them over it. When the deal goes south... Rock ends up falling in with a band of smugglers, while the Blackwater-esque mercenaries hired by his company to kill him and the smugglers for knowing too much end up chasing them down. They have to fight them off. The two main Asian cast members for the entire film series would be Rock and Revy. Both could be relative unknowns. And we have a room for a big-name Chinese actor here for the Chinese market, Mr. Chang, who should absolutely, positively be played by Chow Yun-Fat. The character's modeled on Mark Gore from A Better Tomorrow, so it makes for logical casting. As far as the rest of Lagoon Company goes, Dutch is a older, tough guy role and should be cast accordingly, with an actor of the appropriate age range of Denzel Washington or Samuel L. Jackson. Not those actors necessarily, though both would absolutely work, but someone in that age range. Benny's a white dude, and he should look like he shouldn't fit in with these people, but he clearly does. He's rock if he lasts five years with Lagoon Company, basically. Considering how Daniel Radcliffe is very, very much looking at roles that are the anti-Harry Potter, with stuff like Horns and Swiss Army Man, the role of Benny would actually be a pretty great fit for him. Number four, Bacchano. Hollywood likes gangster films set in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and we generally get at least one gangster film set during this period, sometimes more, every couple of years. So an adaptation of an anime set during this time period in the United States is very likely to get greenlit. And there is a precedent for this in terms of comic book adaptations and such with Road to Perdition. The catch for this is, if you structured Bacchano the same way the TV series is structured, I think a lot of viewers would bounce off it. Uh, of, do of doing non-linear storytelling with multiple stories at multiple times intertwined with each other doesn't quite work. So to do Bacchano as a film or a series of films, you'd actually probably have to do the thing that the, that the novels do and the TV series don't. One chronological story per film. For example, you have one film adapting the rolling bootlegs, the origin where we get introduced to the immortality elixir and a lot of our major characters like Isaac and Miria and that sort of thing. Again, it's keeping with how the original source material is structured, but it's a break from the TV series. And people might, who, who like the TV series and are coming in for that might be annoyed at how actually approachable this is. Now, while Bacchano and 91 Days would also birth, work perfectly well for this slot, as both are stories set in the Roaring Twenties, Thirties, Forties, and that sort of thing, I think 91 Days, because of the pacing of the story, would actually work better as an HBO miniseries, while Bacchano could go on for multiple films. The tricky bit, though, is writing and casting Isaac and Miria. They are two characters who are charming, amiable, warm, and sincere morons. 
and if written, cast, or directed wrong, they could easily get screwed up. It could They could become characters who start out charming and enjoyable and become incredibly annoying, like Captain Jack Sparrow. So that is something to be kept under consideration. Number three, Mobile Suit Gundam. Well, yes, Gundam is popular. It is not really that popular in the U.S., in part due to how intimidating the Universal Century timeline is. I would argue that Gundam Wing, Gundam Seed, and Gundam Double O are far more popular than the original series has gotten. But we have a caveat here. This is the one work on this whole thing which has to be done big budget. And you can't just do one. you got to do a trilogy. Mobile Suit Gundam is, by its nature, though, a series of war films with giant robots. If you approach the films with that content context, you make it work. Again, war films with giant robots, not giant robots in a war film. That's the key. Keep the logic in mind of that this is, this is a war film, and use the language of war films in the movie, and the audience will roll with what you have in mind, will pick up what you're laying down. If you approach the film that way, it can work. The other part of this is you have to fix the terrestrial names. One of the many, one of the weaknesses of Yoshiyuki Tamino as a writer is he's crappy at writing names for non-Japanese. And even with Japanese people, he's kind of run into problems. Keep the Zionic name sounding weird, though. Play up the fact that they're spacer supremacists by having, by giving them weird sounding names and come across that they are rejected terrestrial cultural norms with naming, naming styles. Have them spout plenty of crap about how they're superior because due to the Earth Federation to humans because their souls aren't tied to Earth's gravity and that sort of thing. They're Nazis. They're bigots. Girin in the manga and the anime speaks admir admirably about the Nazis and Hitler. He advocates genocide. Don't forget that when you're writing them. They are nasty people. So, and, and part of this, Char Aznable now works as a name. If you are doing this, if you're trying to find a, a human culture that this is from, that they're from, uh, not human, but terrestrial Earth culture that they're from, Shares Nobel isn't from anywhere. Passfall? That sounds vaguely sort of central to Eastern Europe. Char? No. On the other hand, though, Homino's pseudo Western names need an overhaul. Take a cue from the dubs for the compilation films. Turn Bright Noah and Noah Bright. Similarly, based on the geography from the Gundam and the Origin manga, Amro's mother is from northern Mexico. It's not even like me drawing an inference. They have a map in the manga, and the storyline beats where Amro meets his mother are when the white base is in northern Mexico. So as a semi-nod to Evangelion, have Amro's father take on his wife's last name, and Amro is now named Amro Reyes, because Rey is not a last name that people in the Western world particularly have. Reyes is. That sort of thing. As for the characters played by Bankable Stars, obviously Shara's novel. He is one of the most charismatic antagonists, but not truly villains, in the series, and he's got a big, complex backstory going on with his basically Count of Monte Cristo Cristo S campaign of revenge. Noah Bright as well on the on the heroic side. In general, where you want your bankable stars are Federation characters and Zeon officers who have material to chew on. Ron Baral on the Zeon side, uh, General Revel on the Federation side, that sort of thing. Number two, Fighting Spirit or Hajime no Ippo, using the Japanese title. Sports films are a long-standing part of Hollywood, and boxing films even more so, with the original Rocky getting several Academy Award nominations and the sequels being beloved. Boxing films live and die by the rivals of their protagonists, and aside from Ivan Drago, the best of Rocky's rivals are characters who are sympathetic, particularly Clubber Lang and Apollo, Clubber Lang, rather, and Apollo Creed. And the same applies for the rivals of Makanoichi Ippo, particularly Jason Ozuma and Alexander Zangief. Both characters are foreign boxers and be played by Western stars. Uh, African-American actor for Jason Ozuma and a white actor of some variety or another for um, Zangief. And you get actors who have 
plenty of screen presence and charisma and who look the white the right weight class for going up against Ippo. And they can be the focus of the film. Or the co focus along with Ippo himself. This gives you two movies with bankable actors to boost this draw of whatever Asian actor you cast to play Ippo. So that when you have your third film with Ippo's title shot against Date, you now have the audience coming to see the actor you cast to play Ippo. And they are invested in the character, hopefully, if you do this right. And number one, Log Horizon. I thought about this a bunch and thought about what makes Log Horizon work for an adaptation where other more popular isekai shows like Konosuba or Sword Art Online don't. And what makes Log Horizon work here is Log Horizon is not a death game show. SAO, to be blunt, could be accused of cribbing from plenty of other death game series like the Maze Runner or the Hunger Games in terms of its live action adaptation. Even though those works came out earlier, or that the creators of those works were not cross-pollinating, the stigma is there that you're trying to cash in on the success of those. You're trying to make your next Hunger Games, your Hunger Games. You're trying to make your next big, well, attempt to cash in on the YA novel market. Instead, everything that distinguishes Log Horizon from the other isekai trapped in an MMO anime works in its favor as a live-action film, with one major addition. In the world of the anime, it's set in a scale version of the world where the novel setup is expanding from its original, like, 4 to 1 scale, where it's, like, just slightly smaller than Earth, but everything is where it is normally, to the full 1-1 scale, with the original servers locating characters in a part of the world where they are geographically. If you're playing on... If you're a player in the UK, you're on... European server or UK server and if you're in the United States you're in the United States and this means films don't have to be an adaptation they can be a side story to take the core framework of Log Horizon people are trapped in an MMO world as their characters the mechanics of the game are the same death works as it did before you don't die you respawn at the last cathedral and now the players have to build a society while they try to figure out why they're here and how to get out, and even if they want to leave. Much as with the original game um, show, rather, you had characters in there who had, for example, they, co they had lost the ability to walk in the real world. Now in Log, Hor Log Horizon, they can walk again. So do they want to leave and lose their regained ability, that sort of thing. And there's even more potential here, near the potential to go with this. And you're basically now taking the narrative conceits and you're able to put them in, in a context that would work for a wider Western audience in the sense of you're look, dealing with characters who are approaching things from a the same cultural background as your audience. They're all Americans. Even if their even if your characters aren't white people or aren't straight or what have you, there's a certain degree of, cult, of shared cultural background and cultural experiences based on American school system, how workplaces work in the United States, that sort of thing. The fact that the U.S. is not a parliamentary democracy like Pan is or how uh, Europe, uh, how most European countries are, that sort of thing. And also part of this, because in the U.S. you have full freedom when it comes to star availability. Ideally, your members of your focus guild, the your Log Horizon equivalent, will be actors who you can get for multiple films, and frankly, due to Asian American actors not getting a lot of acting work due to prejudice, see the whitewashing concerns about Ghost in the Shell, you have room to cast Asian American actors in the central role, the recurring role, because, I mean, unfortunately, they're not getting a lot of work. They have room to get more work. A, a multi-picture deal would probably be something that lots of actors would love to get, and you'd particularly have the chance here. Particularly if you have a member of the debauchery tea party from the main series 
who is unaccounted for and possibly could be in the United States, bring them in. Um, have that act. Have your Asian American actor be that connection. That sort of thing. And again, still you have room for plenty of other bankable stars you want to cast, and this huge advantage where you can have them rotate in and out. You don't need to sign a Brad Pitt or a Matt Damon or a Will Ferrell or someone to a multi-picture deal because they can be a fixture character in one film and then rotate out and have them not necessarily be there later because their character is somewhere else. Because it's a big game world, there's lots of people you, in it. That sort of thing. So, what do you think? Please post in the comments below, what anime do you think would fare well as a live-action film? Particularly from Western Studios. Both in terms of the sort of context of the things that I think have to be kept in mind in this post here, or in my list here, or just tossing that out the window if you feel like it. If you think I'm completely off base, post that too and post your reasoning why. <laughs>